so when when uh, when my graduate student speaks, can we can he use the mic? Sure. Um, yeah, they won't be protected or anything. Um, or I can give him this. Um, well, I'm also I'm gonna have this mic, so I might just like. Okay. Okay. Uh, yes. Yeah, this will be a backup just in case. What do you mean by projected? I don't know. What do you mean by projected? They won't. They won't hear themselves. No, no, no. Only the people. Yeah. 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 Only the people online. Yeah. Cool. It is now. Just now? Wow. No, yeah. yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the second colloquium uh, talk uh, in DePaul Research Colloquium. Today we have uh, Dr. Sharewski uh, to talk about ambient tactical deception concept. Now, he's a fourth year assistant professor in DePaul, has been a driving force in this networking and security uh, program. He's been heavily involved in this preparing our team to compete in the national stage and uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, bring trophies and everything. <laughs> uh, that's a good job. Uh, uh, today we have a special announcement. Uh, today we are live streaming our colloquium on YouTube. So uh, all the students uh, who are uh, on online students uh, who used to uh, log on to D2L, D2L to uh, watch a recorded um, uh, uh, like a talk, now we can interact with the speaker via online. So I think that's a, a, a good thing. And these guys have been helping us set this uh, uh, streaming service. And uh, we thank you uh, to that team over there. All right. So uh, talk about Filippo. Uh, he's a cybersecurity researcher, as I mentioned before, and a tactician who constructs and manipulates reality as it unfolds across the cyber physical spaces within our structures, particularly focused on social engineering. So it's a long list of accomplishments. No, you skip oh, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. That, that, that was the uh, crucial part, just social uh, engineering. Yeah, That's Filippo all. Filippo has to talk, uh, talk about his newest research, and let's enjoy. Right. Thanks. Yeah. All right, it's, it's good that I don't know a lot of faces here. So the faces I know, I work with, that's OK. <laughs> um, so I'm part of the Divergent Design Lab. Um, four out of six people that you see here are here. And I want to introduce them because this is a work of the lab. I'm presenting it because um, I have to. <laughs> no, I don't. But uh, I want to introduce. <laughs> Yeah, um, this is me, uh, Paige is in the back, uh, Jess is here, and Peter is not with us, he has a full-time job, of course. Audrey just left, she has another meeting, and Adam is here to help us explain how these things are done. Adam is our undergraduate researcher uh, assistant, so is Audrey, and Peter is our graduate assistant, future PhD. So, um, Division Design Lab does work that... Um, is not readily publishable on a main mainstream venue. <laughs> uh, first, because when people read the version, they're like, okay, we're not going to publish this. <laughs> we go on uh, local or conferences that are um, not necessarily mainstream in security, but we aim to go there just to blow their minds. So this is one of the first, uh, this is a concept that we were brewing for a uh, few years now. And now it took off uh, pretty well. And um, hopefully, if there are still open spots and Isuru needs someone to present in November, then we'll show a sequel <laughs> of, this, so, of this thing. Um, you all have got phishing emails in your lives, right? We all hate them. <laughs> Uh, but it gets boring at some point, right? Now everyone knows what phishing is, and uh, it's it's not something that uh, it's excites us. We developed this concept of ambient tactical deception beyond phishing because uh, I'll go over the, some comparisons with with influencing and penetration, but mainly because uh, the the state of technology now is that. We are so immersed into it that seldom ask ourselves how much trust we can place in it and uh, how much manipulation already happens through it that we are aware of and how much uh, operations, psychological <laughs> operations, actually happen on a daily basis 
that we simply just leave it in the ambience, like we, we don't check that often with the ambience. So uh, we developed an attack that works, that piggybacks on basic social engineering for you to do a basic installation of a malicious software, something that Adam will explain you how it works. Uh, but um, the concept is broke down in a couple of things. First, we borrow from ambience. As I said, ambience is a concept in AI, right? Where you have uh, computers do the things for you without even noticing. And when a security person reads that, his mind or her mind, uh, their, their mind goes like, oh, we're giving computing in, uh, capacity to a human being and we expect the human being to trust. Like, let's try to manipulate it. That's where tactical deception comes in. <laughs> the whole point is that we would like to alter an already an honest content that the user trusts in a way to misrepresent the state of the world. And not to lie necessarily, but just to put something in a different in different words. Um, Adam, would you like to come and go over how this works and then we'll continue unraveling what this actually means in practice. Right, yeah, I will. Uh, so what we have here uh, is a situation where someone emails someone uh, an attachment, something they want to download, uh, and inside it there's some malware. So here the example is a Sticky Notes browser extension. Uh, we use Google Chrome. Uh, they title it Stickies, they grant permission to it. Uh, it says it's going to modify their text. Uh, and then there they've already uh, given in to this ATD attack. And so the extension that they're using will actually modify and change certain keywords uh, through email, uh, different software, social, me uh, social media like Facebook and Twitter, uh, and can actually change the context of the messages or the communications that they're reading. Uh, so the way that uh, we'll do this is have an array of certain words that we're going to swap. So if it's a, a Facebook post, uh, say it's about a political subject, we can take the words like agree, swap them with disagree, uh, exaggerate will become understate. Various words can be swapped and it'll look just like a message that someone has posted uh, or an email that your boss sent you. Uh, so you won't immediately know that there's anything different. By just changing these small little words, uh, you, you have no idea that your entire reality uh, of what this person is sending you has been altered. Uh, and so one of the ways that the uh, extension works is we're using JavaScript. Uh, we have the array of words that we're swapping. We use regular expressions if we want to target certain words, uh, find these uh, keywords, uh, and then actually use this use that array uh, to swap uh, the words back and forth. And so, really, uh, when you have the the uh, extension the way we have it in our test environment, so we'll have a little icon. You have a Facebook post. You know, I agree with this controversial uh, political issue. Uh, with the extension enabled, uh, it can be as simple as I disagree with this controversial political issue. We can use it to create loaded uh, conversations uh, where someone's posting something uh, and is very aggressive about what they're saying. Uh, and then what we're looking at is uh, the response rate uh, of the participants. So if it's uh, an extremely conservative post, uh, we're looking at how people who identify uh, as very liberal, uh, are they extremely likely to respond? Are they going to look over it and talk about it offline? Are they going to maybe wait and see what the other comments are? Uh, and see how likely they are to respond. Uh, and basically what we're doing is just uh, you know, making these small little tweaks, uh, creating something that's just subtly altering someone's perception. And we're trying to see uh, if they fall into this spiral of silence where they're uh, waiting to see how other people respond to it. Yeah, so a few example, like these are screenshots from a Gmail account. So this, this malware works in your browser and it's pretty ambient because you install it and, and forget it. Like, the whole point is for you to install something that is benign at the beginning, and then dynamically to change the content to swap words before any HTML content is presented in front of you. So if someone is trained to do phishing emails, like spawning and figuring out, the first, the email won't go through the spam filter because it's a regional email. What we manipulate is how this email is shown in the browser. So you can check that the email is from me. <laughs> from, that's, that's my face. <laughs> Uh, you can see that HTTPS is there. Uh, there are no flags about it. You know the context. You know that you're working on a project, that there's budget that you have to deliver. It's just the way it's someone asks you about the, uh, the budget. Back to Adam's example, another honest content is this. So if 
for example, we we were playing here uh, with the idea that Bernie is doesn't want to pro project himself as a war president, right? He wants to project him as a peaceful president. So what what the extension does here, it swaps the words commander with organizer. So this is the original post of Bernie, where he says like, you know, I'm not gonna be the actual commander in chief that you'll expect from me to be, but I'm gonna be organizer in chief. And what the the, the malware does is just swaps these words to make Bernie sound, it's gonna be like, okay, I'm gonna be the war president. <laughs> so we would, uh, it seems benign at the beginning, but what we're trying to see how this changes the perception about uh, what Bernie signals as a change in his campaign after the first or the second debate, <laughs> democratic debate. And if someone looks into the Facebook post, it's original, it's just Facebook, it's Bernie Sanders post, it's, it's fair enough. Like, you cannot suspect that this is a link that comes from somewhere else. It checks everything. Third example is AOC. <laughs> uh, with, with, uh, if you follow AOC, she's really direct and straight. And that aligns with any textbook on uh, political speaking, starting from uh, uh, Starting from the beginning of her career, she's, she's just direct in speaking with everyone. And if you see, these are actual original uh, tweets from her. The difference is that uh, this is her original post when she directly attacks the, uh, in the second sentence, directly attacks the president with disagree, something that we change with strongly opposed to him, trying to water down uh, her message. You know, in, in politics, it's the state now is that. If, he, if Ivanka Trump takes a haircut, <laughs> there's an entire uh, noise about what the haircut means. So swapping words between strongly oppose and disagree, and swapping words between things we love and things we hold dear, may mean to someone else. We're not suggesting that this will always be to uh, uh, create some kind of change in perception, but we are right now in a position where we're exploring this. Just because this is go, this goes, this goes beyond phishing because this operates on a legitimate content. It doesn't operate on con. It, it doesn't. So we're different than any trolling that you've seen. Although I have Russian accent, but <laughs> trolling works with fabricated content. This works with actual content from AOC or from Bernie or from anyone else. So that's that. That's the whole point. Uh, Right now, we are, uh, what, what Adam uh, suggested, we, uh, we have done a similar study. It's not in the presentation slides, but we wanted to explore how this manipulation on Facebook posts will pan out in, per in, in perception on how people on campus feel about freedom of expression on campuses. So when the results are in, we'll probably, by the end, we'll, we'll, we'll present in November. <laughs> so the first why someone else would like to do this, okay? Uh, this is a man in the middle advantage. In, yes? So, but how do you uh, determine, like, the context of it? You're, you're, you're operating within a certain context. You're talking about political Yes, context. yes. So, so the, the, the content is something that we're working with natural language processing and a little bit of data science. Uh, for, for us to decide what kind of words to swap, now we are manually uh, doing this just for the sake of speed, but uh, offline we are doing an, like a linguistic pragmatic analysis with NLP to see what words usually, for example, Bernie uses in his speech or his posts, what words AOC does in, in, in her posts, and how those, how those words balance on two uh, polar opposites. Is that answer? Okay. Okay. All right. Fine. Question. There's a whole. There's a whole research. Uh, there's a whole part that is not presented here for the sake of sake of clarity. Of just we would like to present the concept, but uh, the, the 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 decision which which parts go, it's it's done offline so for for now. And just because this is implemented as as a browser, uh, this can be implemented in anything. Like we've done this in so far in browser, and we are doing this in another open source software. Something we cannot mention what's going on, <laughs> because we want participants to come to our lab. But we're doing this in another type of software. 
It's not just in a software that handles HTML. It, it, it goes in a software that handles other types of text. So the whole point is to be able to intercept any kind of uh, discussion. And it doesn't operate in every context. So if you use it automatically for, to, to change every word that is disagreed to strongly oppose, it might look a little bit off. Right? If you use it to change it on a Wikipedia article, the Wikipedia article will look like off. You, you'll see like, oh, something is wrong here. Like something doesn't flow. So this is m really mar micro targeted and really hand picked context so far right now in this state to, uh, to work with. If, you, if you've seen that show, The Americans, have you seen that show, The Americans? No, no, no. I, that pretty much comes close <laughs> to, uh, to, to, to the idea. So an attacker would like to do it. What, what would be the motive? The motive is, for example, for this study that we're going to put, this couple of studies that are, that are in these slides, the whole idea is for us to see how people who use web-based email and work in remote teams, right? Now we, we are. Uh, we are broadcasting this, so students don't have to come physically here. <laughs> how we can uh, alienate people from one from another? How we can make someone feel that their boss hates them? Or how we can make feel that their colleagues talk behind their back? Or things like that. Uh, it's a lofty goal, but the whole point is for us right now to see whether we can cause a split in the reality, a little bit of non-overlapping, uh, not entirely overlapping realities between a sender of email and a receiver of the email. And as I said, like it can be done in, 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 in many concepts we're doing right now in one type of open source <laughs> software and in, uh, and in web, Chrome and uh, Mozilla. So this is the definition. We had to come up with a definition. So, so we can put it in a paper. <laughs> uh, if, so uh, by design as how our attack is different than actual phishing. In phishing, whatever the attacker is, it goes after what the, the, the victim has, right? I want your credentials, I want your money, I'm the prince of Nigeria, <laughs> send me a small <laughs> amount of money, send me an iTunes card, or log in here to change whatever uh, uh, changes has been, needs to be done. That's not what we want here. That the ATD doesn't ask you to send anything back. You're not the one that you talk with the attacker. The attacker just sits there and tries to switch messages between you and the one who you would like, really like to talk. That means that the game of the attacker is what actually the victim perceives. And it's different than scam, as I said, because in scam, you really need a direct exchange. Like the, the attacker stays in a di direct exchange, one shot or multiple shots back and forth with you until you send mo money, until you call someone, until you do something else, open up, things like that. This is not like that. We really want the normal email communication or normal browsing experience or normal Facebook uh, browsing to stay there. It's not that uh, we are targeting that, we're targeting the, the objective is to go for what the victim actually uses as an information to create a representation of reality. So in, in terms of persuasion, I think you've read, have you, have you read uh, Robert Caldini's book, Persuasion? That's, that's a famous, famous book about uh, how persuasion is done. And using those terms, so when, when you have a phishing email, they, used to, they usually try to persuade you using a peripheral peripheral route. That means that they want to catch you on speed, they want to catch you on fear, they want to catch like, oh, this is the boss, Dean Miller sent you an email, You're like, oh, the Dean needs me, right? I need to respond right now. Or any, any kind of like, oh, look at this, someone, five out of ten sports players are using it, there's a huge discount, use this. They appeal to your maybe financial state or emotional state, that's not where ATD goes. Like, uh, the peripheral route doesn't want you to analyze message too much. The, the, the peripheral route of persuasion means that they want to get something out of you without you being able actually in directly analyzing content. Think of yourself how many times you've bought something on discount or... <laughs> 
or anything that happens on, on, on Black Friday here. <laughs> the editor actually wants you to, to analyze what's in the content, wants you to be engaged with the content. Like, hmm, why this person is saying sorry so, so much? Or why Bernie is all of a sudden interested in being commander in chief? Like, he never won't <laughs> want to do that, right? Uh, another thing that editor is playing towards is, uh, is trust, right? We really want to use that, that cognitive comfort that, that, that anyone who is a victim of social engineering lacks because cognitive comfort comes from you being able to assure that you're talking to someone you actually trust, right? If I'm a Bernie follower, I trust that website, right? And I never, like, it, it takes a lot for me to start suspecting whether is this him saying this or someone else is playing tricks, tricks on us. Uh, I put this uh, as, as a third option. I don't know if you've seen Stanley Milgram. You've heard about Stanley Milgram, right? Obedience to authority, to authority, the famous study. No? Okay, so uh, Stanley Milgram did a famous, famous study where he was testing whether people can be obedient to authority. <laughs> and he was asking them to administer electric shocks to a point where they can fry a person. And even though there was a person from the behind yelling, just, just an actor hired who yells, screams, people were constantly asked to continue increasing the, the, the amount of electricity beyond lethal, <laughs> lethal amounts. And the, the study, wildly contested, <laughs> uh, shows that we as humans can, we have tendency to be obedient to, to authority, right? Uh, so the whole point of ATT is to do the exactly opposite, not to be, not to create something that is coercively start, but not to create a boss, a boss that you've had some kind of reserved feelings immediately sound that draconian boss, like, ooh, who's this person who is just all of a sudden slamming me down. That's not the point. The point is to slowly and surely over time create you a bubble around you that you believe that the your boss hates you or the people doesn't like you, but not immediately. Because if it happens immediately, you can pick up the phone and say, like, oh, what's going on? <laughs> or confront them on a chat, right? If, if this goes slowly but surely, not every other email, but if, if an attacker can turn it on and off silently, and you can do that, then you can do this on different internals. That's, that's, the, whole, that's the whole point. So what is not aiding? It's not fake news, right? I said trollings, fake news. We're not playing with fake news. We are not inserting fabricated content. Whoever looks into this is just a legitimate content, a little bit reorganized, right? We may be creating a false statement something if, if we go in a route to, to flip uh, opposite words, antonyms. But if we, use, if we use synonyms, then we're just changing the tone of the text, not necessarily the, the factual representation of what the text has. Again, it's not trolling. Uh, and we're not Cambridge Analytica, okay? <laughs> we don't want to be Cambridge Analytica. We're not interested into uh, micro-targeting and keeping people into, uh, into bubbles. So what UK Labour Party marketing chiefs did, they hired, um, the, the, they, they worked with Facebook to do micro-targeting only with ads about anti-Brexit ads, so that only, only Jeremy Corbyn and his team can see those ads and believe that all the UK is seeing those ads. So this is not related to ads, like Cambridge Analytica did. So we're not going, with, we're not going to sway any kind of opinion or misrepresent through ads. This operates directly on the, on the content. So it's not fabricated, nor is something that it's somewhere around, but not directly on the central, central route. Window. So we started doing this in emails. Emails are, uh, we usually, uh, when you communicate at work, almost all requests come from emails, right? If you're not using some PeopleSoft or Salesforce, <laughs> when you're receiving tasks like that. But we usually, someone sends you an email, like, oh, can you do this? Or like, this is, the thing, please send me back certain certain parameters or numbers or budget or something like that. And any time you have to make a request, even in, both in email and in person, 
you do, uh, people do not always speak in the most direct, most efficient way possible because the blindness theory suggests that we want to maintain positive face for us, that we seek approvals from others, right? We're not imposing to them. And we also want to maintain their negative face just to, just to show to the other person to whom we, we are sending the request or asking that they can remain autonomous and say no or yes, right? I mean, this is based that we are still in a democratic society, right? This politeness might not work in North Korea or other societies, right? If you read just the politeness theory, there is a whole philosophical discussion whether it's face or not. We're not going into that. Like, I have to mention the limitations and limitations in our study. <laughs> but we take politeness theory because we use politeness theory to format emails. Think of yourself writing an email to your faculty advisor, right? If I'm your faculty advisor and you're late with your homework, you're writing to me, dear, dearest, doctor, professor, Trevsky, I hope your day was so great. <laughs> Can I ask you if... <laughs> the, the <laughs> so when you, <laughs> when you, know, when you want to, to approve me, to extend your deadline, while remaining the fact that I'm still the one who teaches the class and I have the autonomy to, to say no, you'll always try to go really polite. So when you're... Uh, when you're writing emails in, uh, in that way, you're choosing between different, between different strategies how to craft politeness. Email is nice as a vehicle for politeness because you can, it's asynchronous, right? How many, like, none of us types an email and sends it right away. And that happens and then you say like, oh, here is the attachment. <laughs> but people write an email and then you can write other things, maybe use emojis, you don't have to uh, but it allows for time for you to revise for messages and grammar and clarity and pretty much to incorporate this politeness based on what you, what you, what you expect, right? So all of this, these two things merge together, make email with a, a choice of a politeness strategy a really nice vector for eight in the attack because it really avoids people to scrutinize the email. So if, if you receive a legit email, you're, you're trying to weed out what they want. Uh, oh, that's me. <laughs> You'll try to, to weed out what, what they want. Uh, and based on that, you can figure it out how much they want it, how much they need it, and how crucial it is for you to respond at that particular, particular moment. So if there is always some kind of tension between a communication, that's where we're jumping with the ATD, and we will try in our study, we've tried in our study, to manipulate how email is formatted, how email is presented, through different politeness strategies. So when you, there, when you have to write an act, that, that uh, face-threatening act, to be able to ask for an extension for your grade, <laughs> for, your, for your homework, you can choose According to the politeness theory, you can choose four strategies. You can choose bold director. I need extension now, or I need a budget now. So, not no student will get extension if they email me like that. <laughs> or uh, no student thinks that they will get any extension if you email me like this. <laughs> Give me an extension now, right? They're going to a better politeness. Okay, oh yeah, Filippo, we need. I need an extension. Can I get it by today? Or if someone needs a budget and they're not the budget person, and Jake is the budget person, instead of yelling at Jake, right, we can ask him, like, okay, look, it is still our game, but can you just finalize it by today because we have to move on? If it's really Jake's game, if, if the budget is so big and crucial, then you're starting telling to Jake, like, look, I know you're busy, but will you meet with us? in an hour, we have a deadline, you're kind of mincing, mincing words. And then you can always go, like there's a fourth type of, uh, the, the highest in this line is when you write something indirectly. Like instead of saying that you need an extension on your deadline, or instead of saying that you need budgets, you're writing possibly about consequences, I might get a C. So leaving me to infer that I need to extend your deadline, uh, deadline for the homework so you won't get, get a C. <laughs> Not directly addressing what your request is. 
you, uh, the choice of which one you will pick based on the politeness theory, which has been tested extensively, question? Oh, no. Is based on three variables or factors. How big of the imposition is, the bigger the imposition is, the higher the politeness strategy. The higher the power of the receiver or the, <laughs> the sender, the higher the politeness strategy, right? You have to appeal. That, that's what the politeness, uh, the politeness theory posits. And the, the bigger the social distance, if we are friends, if Jake is friends with the person requesting, you can send whatever else. You always say like, oh, they're friends. They know what I mean. But the higher the social distance, the higher uh, the higher uh, the higher input the the, the the strategy with most politeness you are picking. So there is a direct relationship between whoever needs to send their email. They see the, they assess the power of the receiver, how good the friend they are. Maybe you can have a friend who is also a dean <laughs> who will respond the email in a way that with his dean had but not his friendship had. <laughs> So all of those things have to consider and how much you're asking for, right? right? If I ask for one extension and then if I ask directly for jumping the grade without being delivery work, that, that can, be a, can be a problem. So what we wanted to see is whether a change in a politeness strategy made by this ATD malware will change whoever receives this email perception of this politeness because the receiver also looks in these factors. The receiver also checks how big an imposition is. The, rec the receiver al also sees like, hmm, who is this person sending me this email? Is it a student, is it a faculty, is it a dean? Or like, do I know this person? Have I met, are we friends? And uh, we've started doing this in a qualitative way as a phenomenon because there, was, there were no other studies before. So that's why I wanted to go s uh, slowly to see how this, uh, this will work, how what kind of uh, findings we'll, we'll find. Um, many of the reviewers who looked in our papers wanted for us to immediately put ethical implications. <laughs> Every time we explain this, people are always jumping in whether this is ethically good or not for us to work on a malware and not to work on a defense. But our response to that is that it's better for us to work and see the dimensions of what malware can do in terms of manipulation Rather than this, to probably goes unnot unnoticed, and then you have some other outfits doing this to a larger scale without our approval. So the whole point of our work here is to find, <coughs> to understand how big, what the attack actually can do, what the attack can't do, how that, what, what are the, what is the context, what are the context is where the attack can be applied. And starting from there to make sure that we are thinking of ways to defend it, right? We are not endowed the center of academic excellence here at DePaul to do purely offensive <laughs> research. We must be on the defensive defensive side. And we will we are on the defensive side, we're just trying to see how this stranger think monster <laughs> moves around. So this is um, we've checked these politeness strategies, whether they're used, so we, we didn't pick it just randomly, uh, the biggest and most available corpus of emails in from Enron. So these politeness strategies are actually employed in emails. That's uh, in a formal setting, that's why we, we chose that. And um, we chose uh, in an email communication where you're talking with teammates or people who might be on the same level as you, Sometimes, the, like, not sometimes, but oftentimes here, the Polar receive emails from other departments that not necessarily have hierarchical relationship with me, but not necessarily I have any kind of a hierarchical relationship. It's just something that they want from me and that I have to decide whether I should uh, deliver or, or not. So the first study that we did was a qualitative study. We, as I said, we seek to find out what ATD does as a phenomenon rather than to do like hypothesis and research question testing. We were able to get 36 participants right, uh, who had at least a year experience, who have been uh, who are 18 years and above. Otherwise, IRB won't allow us to do this. 
Um, we ask them to read an email and give us feedback what they feel is uh, the degree of imposition of the email, what, the, what is the power of the sender or the receiver, and what is the social distance between the sender and, um, and the receiver. The emails look really legit. I'll show you how they look. All of this has to be done just for people not to return your paper for minor revisions. So this was the, this was the paper with a bolt on strategy. Non po no politeness, yelling at <laughs> someone, Sydney. So we picked up like a generic name who yell at Jake <laughs> that they need budget now. And then we also chose a polite, negative politeness strategy. So where Sydney clearly writes the same thing, asks for budget, and the deadline is, is, is today, but in a very different terms. So we ask people to see each of these emails and tell us what they feel is w whether there are any differences on those three factors, the degree of imposition, the power, and the, uh, the social distance, and um, what, what they feel it's, it's going on in their terms. So uh, it, it was an interview-based uh, based thing. So, oops. so for the first, for the first uh, variable, 32 participants are 36 participants perceived an increase of the degree of imposition between the first email and the second email. They thought that whatever Sydney is asking, it's much bigger in the second email than enough, right? In the first email, they said, like, oh, looks, they're definitely giving clear directions. Like, we want this, and this is small budget. But here, when the sender is missing words, that means that this is a huge budget. Right? Four people said, like, said there, said, I don't see no change. They want budget. And it has to be delivered by the end of the day, no matter what. That's what they want from me. That's what I have to do. <laughs> For the power distance, 22 participants started that the receiver has more power over the sender in the second email. Right? Seven participants stated that the receiver has equal power over the sender in the second email. So they perceived that there is an increase in power where they saw the increase in, uh, in, in, in politeness. Four participants saw the opposite. <laughs> felt that the sender has more power over the receiver in the second email. Right? If you're, they felt that if you're asking someone politely, then you still have power over them. You just want to be really polite. So they, that's the new, <laughs> seems like it's a new definition of, of politeness. Slightly diverging from the, from the actual definition of politeness suggested in the politeness Theory. And three participants saw no change. Sender has more power than the receiver in, uh, in, in both events. And for the last part, 25 participants stated that social distance increased in the second email. Right? They felt like in the first email, they're friends, and the second email, they're not. Eight participants said that, that it decreased right? a little bit. <laughs> Counted this, they felt that, oh, now when they're so more polite, that means that they are friends. They have question. Oh. And three participants said like, there is no change. They seem more distance. This is a working environment. I don't see, we don't see a reason why they can be friends. Right. So uh, what, what generally this result su uh, suggests that first you see that in, for each variable, there were three or four people who saw no changes. Right? People who can avoid any kind of an attack. Like whatever you manipulate in the words, I'm able to extract what is what, what people want from me and I'll move on. But for most of the people, this this study so far shows that the tool that changes the politeness strategy silently probably can create a difference in perception, whatever is wanted from uh, Difference in perception about the email sender and difference of perception of the task at at stake, right? That's um, that was the basis for us to try to move in this into a quantitative uh, domain. Oops. So so far we had 78 participants here that uh, were randomly assigned into into groups, right? And we asked the same email, uh, same thing with the with, with the similar emails, just extending to see how this 
because the, the variance, especially in the power and the social distance, prompted us to put this into a little bit of qualitative terms to see whether, uh, to try to explain this variance into, into, di into differences in, in, in perception that are divergent from what the politeness theory suggests. So um, for the degree of imposition, we actually confirmed what, uh, what we actually found in the qualitative, uh, qualitative study. Uh, large Cohen, uh, Cohen D, well, close to it's large still, <laughs> bigger than five. Uh, it's much, uh, much more, uh, people perceive the email, the, the, the second email with a negative politeness, that it's much more imposing than, than the, first, the first email. But for the power distance, we found out that it's quite, uh, quite the opposite. The second email uh, seems that it's uh, less, it seems that the power, the power between the sender and the receiver decreases. So uh, this quantitative study sheds further light saying that an ATD attacker, and that there was no statistical significance. So those, for, for those two variables, we found statistical significance. There was no statistical significance for the social distance. So uh, for the, what, what the quantitative study sheds further light on is saying that an ATT attacker might not manipulate fully the politeness perception of, uh, of a sender of an email in a formal setting, but it can create definitely a perception that someone asks you much more than they actually ask you, and they can mimic that through a perception that that person sounds like a friendly boss. That's 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 pretty much how um, how the quantitative quantitative study goes after after the quantitative quantitative results. The quantitative study goes goes. Uh, we're collecting more and more just to see, just to replicate, try to replicate, right? Replication crisis and all of that. But the, uh, our, uh, res our research question and our idea was to find out whether this manipulation can actually force more, many people uh, to think differently when they see an email different, which, which, something, which is something that you can expect, but something that you don't might expect is that someone else is manipulating what you will probably infer from how an email is presented presented to to you. That's it. <laughs> awesome. Mike. Do you think people are out there using this now? Uh, uh yes. page. <laughs> One of the reasons why, uh, so this is very raw research for us, and we're, we're proving this happens, but um, uh, Jess and I both work in design. We know that people are already using this for marketing. I mean, basically, what we're talking about to a large degree is what's already actively being used in politics, in marketing, even in the last election, um, in terms of disinformation. This is actively happening now. We're really looking at how closely could you target it, and what would happen if, uh, like two of the things that kill people the most often, heart attacks and cancer. You don't have cancer and suddenly die. Cancer builds up over time based on like specific things. It's a slow process. You don't die of a heart attack, although you do, but the heart attack came from fat building up inside of you and eventually breaking free enough of it. So what we're looking at is if you continually do this, if you continually, you could disrupt a relationship, you could disrupt a marriage, you could disrupt a work relationship, and, and, and if you look at something like the, um, the hack of the Iranian um, enrichment facilities, right, that was a very coordinated operation <coughs> to create a dramatic event, but what if you had a very coordinated attempt to create a very ambient, so that you actually destroyed the morale of a team just by making them think. And, and, and I have to say this also comes from academic research, so to all of the faculty in the room, you know what it looks like when somebody's saying something in an email that they're not really going to say and that they can deny that they were saying. We, we experience this all the time, so this is happening actively. This is how do we weaponize this. And we're only doing it to weaponize it because as critical people, we know it's already happening. And I, I, would, I would respond to critics who question the ethics by saying, this is already happening, and our research raises awareness of it. 
Very Have you thought of like, applying this technology for like bullying, anti bullying? Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is this is a uh, this is a dangerous thing. You can, uh, I mean, we are not releasing the code. <laughs> um, we've been we, we've been warned about the, the, that, that the code might be, but uh, the the, ra the raising of awareness, it's more like it's making into a production of uh, like a new gun or a new 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 knife and blade like that. That not that knife might be used for a more sophisticated surgery, but if someone uses it in a different way, they, they can they can slay people. In, in, so definitely can be used for not just manipulating perception. Right now we're working on a paper that we're using this to play with vaccines and anti-vaccines discussions. <laughs> so to rile up <laughs> people, but you can definitely use to, to, to horrible ends. Yeah. Besides awareness, what other, you know, how can, you know, common Joe will know or, you know, what, what's a good way or... Well, that's, that, that's the thing. This falls under a broad uh, umbrella of social engineering because common James, Joes, Philippos <laughs> uh, might not suspect, right? The thing is that we've been conditioned in social engineering to spot awful attachments. Ah, someone is sending a link, someone is sending an attachment. There is no HTTPS. The whole point of this is just to go beyond that. Right. That's why, it's, that's why it stays, stays in the ambience. We are in a really rudimentary state. The awareness part comes from that the technology is now in a point where you can do this. Who says that a Chrome browser shipped or in a way that you can download it and millions of people can download it cannot do this as a function right. of the code inside? We use proprietary software all the time. It's like you said, it's like a different reality. Like yes, yes. And how the awareness is raised? Yeah, I mean, that's the tough one. Yeah, that's the question. There right has now. to be a new type of social engineering training, right? Yeah, yeah. From obvious reasons, we are not allowed to send this malware to actual full participants. We have to obtain their consent. Otherwise, <laughs> we will not be allowed. But we suspect and speculate that if this kind of thing, because we took the idea of, of, the, of the browser uh, from a report that says that so many uh, plugins, browser plugins that are on the Google market, change their behavior dynamically to do things that Google doesn't even know that, that they do. Scrap for information, copy and paste a credit card, delete some, some portions in, the, in, in, in local files, things like that. We're like, oh, if that can be done with a couple of swaps of words, no one is going to notice that, right? Like that. Uh, have you read uh, Cuckoo's Egg book by Cliff Storer? They, they, they caught that hacker just because he noticed a small fraction of 0 0.05 cents that they were missing in their bank account for printing credit at, uh, at uh, University of Berkeley, right? Yeah. <laughs> and that unraveled an entire thing. So small things can, 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 can create this kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, one way of detecting this, obviously, is if it ever gets back to the source. The yes. The source sent it, it got modified, and if somebody then mails back and says, I can't believe you said this, or yes, sends it out course. to the larger group, look what they guy said, and yes. then the source sees it. Yes, absolutely has a lot of limitations. Absolutely. Our, yes. It does to some degree, but if it depends on where the person in the middle is. Because yeah. if you if you are actually, we're actually using it, and I hope to be moved to this eventually, especially with funding, if we are using um, artificial intelligence and machine learning, you could actually control the ingoing and the outgoing, right? So only if, <laughs> only if you pick up the telephone, and that's and that's part of the point as well. Jerry Boyle, who works for the National Lawyers Guild, he's a Chicago lawyer, um, deals with a lot of um, dissident groups and protest groups, talks about the fact that if you really want something to be encrypted in secret, then you walk up to the person and whisper it in their ear. And if I have a message, that is, um, that is what my research is most interested in, is that we have allowed these networks to become so much a part of our life that this is possible, especially for remote workers, right? So if you, if you want to avoid this, yeah, pick up the telephone and say, 
are you pissed off? <laughs> but we don't do yes. that. And I know we don't do that because I did that in yep. academia with our email communication. Yeah. And their malware that, that targets an actual exchange platform. So this can be done in an exchange platform right away. That changes right actually in the SYM <laughs> body of the email with it. So if if someone uh, goes with forensic, you can you can set up someone that they are, for example, racist or not, right? And like, oh, they're racist. I took a screenshot of of my computer, and they're like, well, no, I was not. We can launch a, a forensic investigation, and if they took forensic logs, they will see the original email. <laughs> they will create a little bit of of refraff there, but. You can put this further on to actually insert, to actually disrupt the integrity on an actual system level in the in the in the exchange server. So it can be investigated. It's just, would you even you know like you're not gonna just call everybody, like, hey man, you're, you're a little mad over there or yeah, what's going on? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Pick, yeah. yeah. That's you have tough. to pick yeah, up that's the phone. Subtle. That's it. Okay. Any other questions? So, <coughs> quick question. Sound, uh, I'm new to this. So, uh, can you like manipulate uh, these messages when you are saving it? So, you type the original message and you save it. Uh huh. It gets saved as a different one. So, you think you type the correct one? That has to that 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 has to work with a malware that works on the Exchange server. Okay. So, we were we were manipulating only in the the change happens in this attack. Only before a content is rendered in a web browser. Like only when you take. Okay, right now. Okay. Yes. Yes. But technically, that's that, that's possible. Our whole like the, the, the whole concept where we're moving it now is just to see how that that had happened. How that can happen? Not only in web, but in other interactive technologies. So you're saying that even if the message is authenticated or something like that. Yes. It's only when it's displayed that it's being. It's only when it's displayed is is changed. Someone, someone emailed, emailed back. Uh, some of the reviewers in one of the papers, like, "Oh, this will be caught by Proton Mail, this mail, this kind of change." I'm like, maybe, but the point is that we wait for all of those checks to pass, all of the encryption to went nice, everything to be good. Just the moment that it's presented is the final filter before it comes to your eyes. Yeah. That's why it's in the ambience. All right, thank you. Thanks. Right, thank thank you. you. So, Farish, uh, watching. Yeah, it was a good presentation. <laughs> 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 <laughs>